been a, a slight change in our program. Unfortunately, Dr. McGraw was not able to make it. He had to cancel unexpectedly. However, um, we are pleased to have um, Dr. Stephen Shu speak from Michigan State University, and he'll be talking on the genomic prediction of complex traits. Thank you very much. Is my mic on? Oh, it sounds like it's on. So um, I have to apologize because I was recruited for this talk on relatively short notice. And the slides that I'm going to present to you are the ones I used last week when I was at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And so these, these slides were actually prepared for physicists and mathematicians. But uh, don't worry. Uh, I will get through these expeditiously and without hopefully too much pain to the audience. Um, if there are two things that I would like you to take away from this talk, they are as follows. Number one, despite the dizzying complexity of these traits that we're talking about today, uh, I believe that we will be able to capture most of the heritability of these traits in the form of predictors. So we will ultimately, given enough data, I believe the algorithms actually necessary to do this are already in good shape, but given enough data, we will actually be able to build relatively precise predictors for many of these traits, most of these traits. And the example that I will give you today is a predictor that my group constructed for height. So we are able to predict human height from SNP genotype alone to plus or minus about three centimeters, about an inch. And, you know, the future one would, could even do better. But I would say the result is probably a little bit surprising since I think most people thought that uh, there were huge chunks of missing heritability uh, that would remain hidden for quite a long period of time. But here we are with a good height predictor. The second take-home message that I want to get across, and that's the more subtle thing that requires all these slides full of equations, is that we understand the performance of our algorithms well enough that given some basic information about the trait, given the heritability of the trait, and given an estimate of the number of causal variants or the sparsity of the trait, we can predict the size of the data set that one needs to, quote, solve it. In other words, to build a good predictor. And if you, some people here who are at the Allen Institute may remember a talk that I gave a few years ago on precisely this topic where I predicted where we would be able to build the height predictor and you will see that all the predictions came true. Okay, um, now how did I get involved in this field because I'm actually a physicist. Um, I got involved when I noticed this curve. Everybody knows this curve I'm sure in this room. And I think we should be optimistic that uh, these kinds of trends are going to continue and that we're, we're really entering a golden age uh, in this field. And, and I think young people here are, are really lucky because of the discoveries that they're going to see. Now, I want to make a small point here, which is that currently SNP genotyping costs are below $50 per person, whereas whole genome sequencing costs are under 1000 but still quite substantial. And this factor of 20 difference in cost is in my mind, uh, very decisive in placing the bang, best bang for the buck per dollar still in the regime of SNPs. In other words, I would rather have the whole genome of a person in my study, but I would not want to pay 20 times more to get that whole genome. And so the, the studies that you know, I think realistically can and should be funded now are large studies trying to aim at millions of people, uh, but in which most of, the genes, uh, most of the genotypes are actually obtained through SNP arrays. Okay, um, so what are we trying to do here? We are trying to model a quantitative trait. So uh, taking the example of height, let's suppose that Y is the phenotype for an individual. Uh, someone is, say, 183 centimeters tall. And we want to reproduce that phenotype. We want to predict that phenotype from variables which can be measured about that person, such as the, the individual SNP values. And in order to do that, we're going to have to determine certain parameters in the model. And those parameters are effect sizes. Most of the effect sizes will be zero out of, say, a million SNPs or three billion individual base pair loci. Uh, most of them will not actually have an effect or measurable effect uh, on the phenotype, but perhaps a large number, 1,000 or 10,000 or 20,000, will affect the trade. So the number one problem is first to figure out which SNPs are actually going to have an effect and then what is the appropriate effect size for that SNP. In this general expansion of the function y of g, I have nonlinear terms, which I think in the future we will focus on. But at the moment, it is clear that just uh, using a simple additive model for genetic effects is sufficient actually to capture quite a lot of predictive power. 
And for people who are working in this field who are not familiar with what is being done in the animal and plant, in the agricultural realm, I invite you to go look at it because, for example, the milk that we drink comes from dairy cows that are bred using predictive SNP models. And the semen from prize bulls um, goes for thousands of dollars per, I don't know what unit they use, milliliter, um, partial liter or something. Um, so that industry is really quite advanced, and they have very, very good mod predictive models of this type built already. Okay, so the, the mathematical subject that I want to talk about uh, is something called compressed sensing. It's something that has been developed just in the, coincidentally, just in the last 10 or so years. It's been the subject of intense investigation by people from math and statistics and computer science. Um, and a lot is known about this technique. So imagine that you're faced with this problem. You're given a bunch of values of y. In our case, these are the phenotypes. You're given the values of the, 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 the genotypes for a bunch of individuals. Each individual is labeled by i. And you're asked to determine uh, these effects vectors, uh, the components of these effects vectors x sub j, and there's some noise. And this noise is essentially 1 minus the heritability of the trait. So the higher the heritability of the trait, the smaller the normalization of this noise term. The lower the heritability of the trait, the larger uh, the normalization of this noise term. And the other information that you know is that uh, typically x is going to be sparse. Most of the entries uh, of x are going to be 0, and some a fairly in absolute terms large number, like 10 or 20,000 of them are going to be non-zero, but most of the million or so uh, entries in this vector are going to be zero. Okay? Um, what you're searching for is an algorithm that takes into account that prior, that prior information that X is going to be sparse. So you want to enforce sparsity, but still, still find a set of X's uh, that satisfies, that fits the data as well as possible. Um, now, it turns out that the optimal way to do this, uh, which I'll explain in the next couple of slides, is to introduce something called an L1 penalty. And that L1 penalty enforces the sparseness of this vector x as the algorithm progresses. Um, the interesting result is that the amount of data one requires to solve this problem scales linearly in the sparsity. So given the number, uh, it, it's proportional to the number of non-zero components of the vector x, but it only scales logarithmically in the number of unknowns, the, the, the dimensionality of this list of possible effects or the, the total number of SNPs. So doubling the number of SNPs that you're considering doesn't really hurt you as far as the data threshold requirement, but doubling the complexity of the trait, doubling the number of causal variants actually does cost you quite a bit. Okay. So in pictures, uh, this is the problem that we're trying to solve. Each entry in this vector y is the height of somebody in this room. Uh, if this is my height, then this row is my genotype. The second row is the genotype of somebody else, et cetera, et cetera. So each row of this matrix is a genotype. And the thing we're trying to solve for is this effects vector. Most of the entries of this effects vector, these white squares are zero, and then there are a few non-zeros, which are blue. So we want to figure out where those non-zeros are, and then we want to figure out what value we should stick into those uh, components. And then once that's done, we'll essentially have a kind of polygenic model that people have been talking about in uh, earlier lectures today. Now, if you're a mathy person, you can read this slide and it gives you a geometric explanation for why the L1 norm is the optimal norm. The L1 norm both enforces sparsity on the solution to the, uh, to the, the con condition of good fit. Uh, however, when, uh, when, when you choose the L1 norm, the optimization problem is still convex and it's something which is tractable mathematically. Um, in words, without understanding all the equations, the basic point is that there's a trade-off between computational tractability and the ability to enforce sparseness on the solution. And it turns out L1 is sort of the magic compromise, and hence that has been, the, the L1 penalization has been studied extensively uh, in, the, in the last decade or so. Okay. So the objective function that we are going to optimize uh, is given by this. It is the sum of squared deviations from the prediction, given a certain candidate vector x, uh, and the actual heights, y. And then there's a penalization term which uh, calculates the, which depends on the L1 norm of the effects vector x. And as I mentioned, the optimization is convex, uh, it, so uh, this is a problem which is fairly tractable. 
Um, it's extremely fast and not very difficult to execute on a computer. Um, and there are many recently proved theorems about the behavior of this uh, algorithm, which uh, have, have uh, been developed in the last decade or so. Um, the most important property of this algorithm that we're going to use is something called a phase transition in its performance. So as I vary the amount of data that I have available to myself, and I run the algorithm each time with different amounts of data, there is a kind of sharp behavior in the performance of the algorithm as I cross a certain threshold. The boundary for that phase transition is universal. In, so that if you calculate where that boundary is for some simulated set of data, you can then predict for real data where to find that boundary. And uh, for traits which have heritability of about 0.5, so that means half the variance is genetic, maybe the other half, uh, so say half the variance is additive genetic and the other half is maybe some nonlinear stuff and maybe some environmental stuff. Um, the, the key takeaway message is that the threshold amount of data that you need is about 30 times sparsity. So if you know the sparsity a priori of your trait, and later in the talk I'll talk about how one estimates this S from GWAS data, um, if one knows the sparsity of the, of, the, of the trait a priori, then one can estimate how much data one needs to actually solve for the predictor. Um, this phase transition is so famous that it has a name. Uh, Donahoe, it's called the Donahoe-Tanner phase transition. And let me bring you back to when you took an elementary physics course. So uh, imagine this were not uh, a diagram related to genomics, but imagine this had something to do with pressure and temperature of a little bottle of water. Um, as we reduce the temperature of the water, uh, it in, at higher temperatures it prefers to be a liquid, but below some critical temperature it prefers to change its state rather abruptly uh, into some kind of solid like uh, ice. Okay, and, and that, that critical temperature or pressure, pressure temperature curve where that happens is the phase boundary. In this case, we're looking at the actual performance of the algorithm. The regions that are in red are where the algorithm performs poorly, and the regions that are in blue are ones where the algorithm performs very well and the predictor is extremely accurate. The uh, axes of this plot, the vertical axis is the sparsity, so the number of non-zero values that you're trying to determine divided by the amount of data that you have. So as the amount of data increases, you traverse downward in this graph. Um, delta is given by the amount of data that you have divided by the number of SNPs that are in the problem. So P could be, say, a million or a few million. Um, and so as you have more data, you traverse downward and to the right. And if you're lucky enough to have enough data and you're running in this region of the phase diagram, uh, then you get very good results. If you're running in the bad region of the phase diagram, you get very poor results. The diagram on the left is the result of simulations we did several years ago using real genomes but using uh, simulated data. And this is the noiseless case. So this would be the case uh, of a fictitious trait that had heritability 1. This is the case where a uh, more realistic case where you have heritability 0.5. And when you have heritability 0.5, you don't actually cross the, what was originally this phase boundary in the noiseless case. You don't cross it until you're at a value of rho, which is about 1 over 30. So when rho is 1 over 30, the amount of data that you need is about 30 times s, and that's where this figure comes from. So we knew already a few years ago that if, uh, given that, say, we expected a uh, sparsity for height of 10,000 or 20,000 uh, individual SNPs uh, in a predictor, uh, you might need something like a few hundred thousand or 500,000 uh, data points to actually solve it. And so that was a prediction that we made several years ago. And it all comes from looking at the the small row part of this phase diagram. Okay, so let me make a distinction between two very different uh, mathematical problems. One problem is to determine with very high confidence SNPs that have some st statistical association with a particular phenotype, with say height. And uh, we have learned the hard way after going through a very long period of time dealing with candidate genes and relying on biological intuition, et cetera, et cetera, which I think, as Jonathan pointed out, paid us basically zero or negatively. Uh, and we've now settled on a very robust uh, 5 times 7 minus 8 standard for genome-wide significance. And thank goodness now uh, hits which are found at this level of significance regularly replicate. We, one can expect them to replicate. Um, this problem which the field has kind of been focused on, I think you'd say for the last five years or more, is quite different from the mathematical problem that you want to solve if you want to build the best possible predictor. 
Those are two very different problems. Rather than first try to identify the SNPs as well as possible using this and then adding them up in some way to make a polygenic score, uh, one could in fact uh, perform a very non-trivial high-dimensional optimization to get a much better predictor than what we get by simple uh, polygenic weighting. And that's what we did. Um, now, uh, if the trait that you're interested in is simple, if it just depends on a few variants, then you know, maybe number one is okay. But when you get to traits that, depends on th that depend on thousands of variants, the difference between constructing a polygenic score from one and actually doing some kind of more sophisticated optimization can be uh, quite significant. Okay, so this is the situation as of, I would say, just maybe a year or two ago. Um, missing heritability associated with height. Um, from, say, twin studies, uh, one might expect that uh, the broad sense heritability of height could be as much as 80%. Um, from GCTA, which is a technique for estimating the heritability associated with uh, common SNPs, uh, one might expect that about 45% uh, variance was up for grabs. But uh, building a predictor from all the known GWAS hits only got you a small fraction of that. And so all of this was missing, and all of this is missing. This dark blue component is still missing, I, I think basically because we don't have uh, enough control over rare variants. Probably we need to get whole genome sequences to do this. But uh, what I'm going to show you now is accounting for this missing heritability. So getting from uh, what was the previous GWAS result to basically the predicted SNP heritability uh, for height. Okay, so we took this objective function, which I've now talked about uh, quite a bit. Uh, we took the data from the UK Biobank, so uh, after um, quality control, after um, filtering for ethnicity, so all the results I'm going to tell you now are, are really just for um, people with Euro primarily European ancestry uh, from the UK. Um, we had about 450,000 individuals. And uh, the protocol that we used was we divided that into a big training set with a somewhat small holdback set. That holdback set is actually used to set this penalization parameter, which determines uh, where the threshold is actually set for, for which, uh, SNPs, which effects to turn on and which effects to turn off. And then a final uh, validation set, which is out of sample, is used to make sure that the whole thing really works. If you come from the machine learning community, uh, what I just said to you is basically we have a training set there's a little bit of funny business in terms of uh, because of this uh, unknown parameter and the ob objective function. Uh, we have to use that little holdback set to, to set this uh, parameter. But basically, then we do out of sample validation and check to see that the whole thing works. Okay. Um, these are the results for height. Um, what we're presenting here is only 2,000 individuals. We have a lot more individuals, obviously, we could present to you. But the reason we chose 2,000 is because your eye can still sort of see the density of people. If you start presenting more points, then you start to get sort of just black spaces, and it's a little bit hard to tell where the people are. Um, the error bars are computed within each bin. So within a chunk of people, we just compute the standard deviation on a much larger data set, and we just, and we just plot that standard deviation. So the standard deviation doesn't vary very much. It's about uh, three centimeters or less uh, everywhere along the curve. Um, red dots are females. Blue dots are males. And so if I went to a crime scene and the detectives gave me some DNA and from the DNA I got a SNP genotype, I could predict the height of the, the criminal, say, uh, plus or minus about three centimeters. Okay, and, and for trait, uh, which is extremely complex. Um, this shows the success of the predictor trained on different uh, training sets, sizes of training sets. So starting with only 100,000 people, 150,000 people, and then all the way up to about 450,000 people. And it has the property that it seems to be hitting some kind of asymptote. And so uh, it does seem plausible that, uh, you know, we're nearing um, sort of, you know, we won't, we'll get, we'll get uh, limited in improvements in quality as we, as we add to this. But, but there's still some room, I think, left for improvement. Um, this blue curve is for bone mineral density. Uh, which is also one of the UK Biobank uh, phenotypes. And again, there we have built actually a pretty good predictor for bone mineral density from basically following the same methodology. Okay. Um, if you look inside our predictor, if you look inside this vector X, uh, out of the million SNPs or so that uh, are candidates, uh, there are about 20,000 activated SNPs. 
And uh, here, they, here are their locations. Um, if the SNP has a, I think it's the minor allele, if the minor allele has a net positive effect on average on height, then uh, you get, we, we, we put a little bar up like this. If it has a net negative effect uh, on height, then uh, the, I think it's the minor allele again. Um, we put the bar down here. So um, if you like, now, now, of course, with more data, with uh, some optimizations, we'll do better than this. We'll get a predictor that's actually better than this. But you could consider this a rough first sketch of the genetic architecture, at least as far as, far as common SNPs are concerned, of human height. Okay, you could, you could, you know, if you took a very fine resolution photograph of this, you could read off where all these SNPs are. Okay, uh, here's an out-of-sample validation. Um, this is in ARIC, which is, uh, I think, a heart disease cohort. Uh, these are Americans now, so uh, the model was trained on British people. Uh, these are Americans. Ethnicities are still sort of predominantly European, um, but uh, I think the average age of people, and someone should correct me because they know better than I do, but uh, the average age of people in the UK Biobank is such that I think they were kind of growing up in the post-war era. And I think Americans actually had better nutrition uh, during that period of time than Brits. And so um, they are sort of qualitatively different environments that we're talking about here. But the predictor that was trained on the Brits uh, still works pretty well in Americans. And um, if you actually look at the numbers, there's a slight decrease in predictive power. But a lot of that slight decrease is just because um, these people were genotyped on a different SNP set, and we had to use a kind of overlap SNP set and some imputation. And most of the power loss, actually, I think is due to that, not due to the fact that we're considering a different population of people. Um, this shows the nature of the phase transition and how one determines this uh, penalization parameter. So, so you, what we're doing is you're kind of testing, as the algorithm is running, it's sort of testing uh, various values of lambda against the holdback, the small holdback set, and it uses that to set lambda. You can see there's very sharp behavior uh, in lambda, and that's, uh, that is indicative of a kind of phase transition. Okay, so what have we done so far? We've done height, we've bone dens done bone density, we've done BMI. I think our educational predictor, educational attainment predictor, this is all UK Biobank stuff, it correlates about 0.3 with actual educational attainment, so it's about 9% of total variance. Um, uh, we can do hair color, baldness, grip strength, there's all kinds of miscellaneous traits uh, that are in the UK Biobank uh, cornucopia that uh, we've run uh, this algorithm on. Um, my guess is that we can capture most or all of the GCTA common SNP heritability for even the most complex traits. So in this case, height, there's really not much that's more complicated than height, maybe IQ. Um, now, the thing to remember is that if you have up for grabs a, a common SNP heritability of about 0.5, you could get a correlation approaching 0.7. And our correlator for height is actually approaching 0.7. So, um, when you have a correlation of approaching 0.7, you can easily do things with that. You can easily pick out outliers, right? You can say, this person is definitely not a tall person. This person is way below average in height, or this person is way above average in height. So you don't need to have perfect correlation or capture all the variants associated with the, with the genetic uh, causes in order to use two useful things. Okay, um, I'll say a little bit more about disease risk. Uh, but, okay, before I do that, let me say something about estimating the sparsity S. So there was this parameter S, which if you wanted to do prospective analysis of a study that you want to do, and you, you want to say, how much data am I really going to need in order for this algorithm, this compressed sensing algorithm, to run well, you, you need to know what this parameter S is. And then you just multiply it by a, a factor, uh, and you, then you have your estimate. But how do you estimate uh, the sparsity a priori? Well, if it's a trait where there's already been some GWAS work, then you have some GWAS hits that you trust. And then it's basically a matter of extrapolating that curve of uh, variance versus, uh, say, variant MAF versus effect size. There's a distribution of effect size versus MAF. And you're basically just extrapolating that distribution and until you have captured all the heritability that you think is there. And from that, you can estimate what S is. Now, I've picked this paper just because it came out recently, and they are effectively doing what I just said. Uh, but they do it for a very large range of traits, and so I'll show you their results just uh, as, a, as, a, as a guide. Uh, for example, they do height, they do BMI, they do uh, cholesterol, they do intelligence. And typically, they, what they typically find for the, uh, their estimated sparsities for uh, all of these traits are typically in the 5 or 10,000 uh, SNPs 
Okay, so um, this is a graph from their paper. You probably can't read uh, all, what all these curves are, but each of these curves is a different trait. Um, the total area under one of these curves, because the vertical axis is the density of SNPs, uh, density of causal variants, um, the total area is proportional to the sparsity. So the, the hardest traits to do will be the ones with the most area. The easier ones will have less area. Um, so the blue lines are typically things like BMI, height, hip circumference, waist circumference, waist hip ratio. Um, cognitive performance is this red line. I don't know what the difference between cognitive performance and intelligence is. Intelligence is this red dotted line. But you can see that although there are differences between these traits, the genetic architectures of these traits, uh, they're not really qualitative, I mean, they're not really extreme differences. They're all kind of somewhat similar. And as far as our algorithm goes, um, you know, you're talking about basically maybe a factor of two in uncertainty in what parameter S you should stick in for these traits. Okay, so, so my prediction would be if you can get a million genotyp genotypes and fairly clean IQ scores, fairly clean intelligence measurements, you can solve cognitive ability the way that height has been solved. Okay, um, back to diseases, this is just a page that I took from, uh, I think, Snipedia, which is, I think, maintained by NIH, and this is an alphabetical list of uh, various traits or phenotypes, conditions, and uh, what the estimated heritabilities are, and we, I showed you the simulation results for H squared equals 0.5, I could show you them also for H squared, H squared equals 0.3 or H squared equals 0.8, but you can see there's a quite a large number of traits that are sort of roughly in this range where this rule of thumb that you just take 30 times S and that's basically how much data you need to build a good predictor, um, it would it could potentially be applied to a, quite a large number of these uh, traits and of course this goes all the way down to Z. Okay, So if I had Francis Collins here I would say, hey Francis, why don't you fund some studies where, you know, I would claim the theoretical arguments I gave are pretty strong, uh, why don't you fund some studies that will actually accumulate sufficient sample size to actually solve this condition. Why, why fool around? Okay. Um, now, in the case of a disease condition, the worst case, in, in the best case, you might have a quantitative score of severity, but in, typically you wouldn't. You would just have some kind of case control uh, data. And there's a whole set of methods in compressed sensing where compressed sensing has been adapt, adapted to so-called one-bit data. And we've done simulations of one-bit compressed sensing, and we find that, you know, it's a little bit worse, maybe maybe you need a few times more data. This this 100S is conservative, but you need, probably need a little bit more data than you would for a quantitative trait. But still, it's quite possible to build uh, good predictors of risk uh, for these binary conditions. Okay, and as I said before, if H squared is, say, 0.5, just to take a, a sort of intermediate value, you really can do very good identifier of outliers. So if you have a public health system, you want to push the care, preventative care, toward people who are most at risk for a condition. The ability to say, just identify with fairly good accuracy who the, you know, three percent or two percent of the population that are really most at risk for a particular health condition are. That the value of that in dollars has just got to be enormous. Okay, so uh, let me conclude, uh, and I just have a few more slides after this about IQ, but uh, let me just conclude about this in this part. Um, I think complex traits are tractable. Um, you know, obviously extremely difficult. People have been laboring at this for a long time. It seems like accumulating hundreds of thousands of people is a big data set, but you really have to analyze that data set correctly to get the predictor out. Um, GCTA estimates of common SNP heritability, I believe, are probably roughly accurate. Okay? Not as accurate, maybe, as Peter Vischer would claim, but they are roughly accurate. And and they, they are a reasonable guide to figure out uh, what's actually going on. Um, the heritability that's predicted, that's estimated here, can be captured in a predictor. Uh, we can a priori make rough estimates for how much data you need to actually successfully build this predictor. And there are many targets, there are many quantitative traits and disease risks that one could go after. And coming from physics, I find the situation here very strange because when we build a $15 billion uh, accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider, we, we know what we're doing ahead of time. We have theory, everybody agrees on the theory, we know that if we build it with this capacity and these performance characteristics, we will find the Higgs boson. Or if we put a 
billion dollar satellite in orbit to look back at the Big Bang, we know what sensitivity we need to actually see the microwave uh, perturbations from the Big Bang. So there's a kind of systematic level of planning that requires some theoretical basis, which I think the field is now ready for, but then you have to engage in some kind of planning to tell the funding agencies, this is really what should be done. And I, I think the field is kind of at that point now. Okay, so uh, let me switch gears a little bit and just talk about what I think is the most interesting phenotype of all, and that's cognitive ability. And everybody knows that uh, you know, we are, our DNA is very little different from that of chimpanzees or early hominids, but our brain function is really quite different. And so obviously the most interesting question is what exactly are the changes uh, in our DNA that make, say, us much smarter than early hominids or make one human, one individual smarter than the other or less intelligent than the other. Um, and I think this problem is actually somewhat close to being solvable because of the arguments that I gave earlier in the talk. And so if you look at the SNP-based heritability for cognitive ability, it, it's somewhat less than for height, but it's not that much less than for height. And if you look at the sparsity estimates, I showed you the Hopkins paper a few slides ago, it's also somewhat similar to height, maybe a little bit worse. So worst case, I would say maybe you need two or three times more data to do IQ than you needed to do height, but it, it, seems, it seems like it will be tractable. Now, uh, this is my last slide. Um, this is a, a longitudinal study from New Zealand, and it's using, I think this is, somebody here will know better than me, I think it's the EA2 polygenic score predictor. It's, so it's, 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 it's certainly not the best that can be done. But uh, this is a so-called Dunedin study, Dunedin study in New Zealand, and they tracked about 1,000 people from childhood into middle age. And so they, they basically know the life history of each of the people in the study. Each blue dot is, I think, 10 people. And so they can score. They, they, know, they know where these people originated, so whether they came from a low SES or high SES family. Uh, they know what they did in their lives, so they can score how successful, if you like, they were in life. So you get plus points if you went to college, raised a family, stayed out, stayed out of jail, avoided substance abuse. In that case, you score, you know, your score is higher. If you had problems, uh, your score is lower. Okay? And so the question is, could I, and, and now they've gathered, uh, they've gathered saliva and SNP uh, genotypes for these people, um, could I, with a polygenic predictor, have predicted, you know, not perfectly, of course, life is so complex, but could I at least have crudely predicted who was going to uh, do well and who was not going to do well in life? And there is clearly some signal in here, uh, even after controlling for the socioeconomic status of the families. Um, as I mentioned, I think, in a comment um, on an earlier talk, um, it does seem that within a particular social class, if you have a higher polygenic score, you're more likely to do well. Uh, the, I think upwardly mobile was the term used. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you have a low polygenic score, you're more likely to be down, downwardly mobile. And that seems to be true across all three uh, SES brackets. Um, the average score for people in the low SES categories is, 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 is below the average. And the average polygenic score for people in the high SES families tends to be above the average. And so it, it realizes all the horrible social Darwinistic things that we feared might be true, uh, but but here they are, and and I think that given uh, any amount of effort in this direction, we will be able to tighten up the scatter in these predictions in the next five or ten years. Five or ten years is almost too much. I think we could do better relatively soon, but eventually one will be able to do this kind of thing with with uh, some level of precision. So I, I'll stop there. Lots of questions. Um, uh, Pierre? Oh. <laughs> There's a microphone coming to you shortly. So, you build the model of height on UK Biobank, and you show that in Eric you don't have a lot of lost on the model, and you, you are saying that this is more a problem of fewer arrays than more really changing population. If I wanted to build a general model for the full human population, do you think it will work? 
in particular, do you think that the methodology that you are using with this L1 weighting will have a problem in particular if you start to have variants that are uh, present only in some population and absent in the other? Yeah, so uh, great question. So first let me say several groups have now emailed us that they've replicated or validated our results so uh, on different populations, but always, always European populations. Okay? In our own testing, which we didn't publish, uh, we have tested the predictor on other ethnic groups. And basically, as you would predict, as a function of genetic distance of that test population versus the training population, there is some decay in the quality of the prediction. Um, now, I personally think that the cause of that is that you know, we, we aren't getting the true causal variant. We're getting a tag of the causal variant. And the correlation between the tag and the causal variant may be different or worse in the other population. And I think that's the problem. It, it could be actually something more fundamental than that, but I actually believe that probably genetic architectures are not different among different human ethnic groups. But So probably it's just this tagging problem. Um, I would say, though, that if you wanted to have, like, say, uh, the government of Japan want to have a very good predictors of these types for its population, they better assemble a very big Japanese cohort. I mean, that's the only way to be sure, right? You wouldn't want to take the cohort from some other ethnic group and just be confident that you could apply it in your group. So, you know, again, to do a study with a million people, it's like 50 million bucks. And, you know, I think some governments can afford that. Jonathan? I was just curious about is that on? Okay. I was curious about the, uh, if you compare the method uh, that you've presented based on compressed sensing to uh, other methods uh, for predictions, such as LDPRED, or actually there's another one that uh, uses a L1 penalty, if I believe, by uh, Paksham and his group. How does, um, how does the method uh, you presented uh, fare compared to So these? these are just really rough estimates. I haven't, I haven't looked at LDPRED. Um, if you just compare it to simple polygenic score prediction, um, I think at similar amount of training data, you probably capture two, maybe three times as much variance. Uh, it's, it's definitely a multiple like that. Maybe not three, but more than two times as much variance. Um, if you, the, the, what Pak Sham has done is written a nice paper in how to do compressed sensing, but with summary statistics data. And that's something we're very interested in. We're actually working on that right now. So that, that would allow you to combine sort of meta-analysis type studies, but actually run this algorithm on that data set. The trick is that the, the LD matrix, the, the matrix of correlations on the SNPs, you need to get that somewhere. So you might get that from one population, but then feed in the correlation data from some statistics from other studies. If that can be made to work, and so far it's not, it's kind of working, but uh, I could go into more detail, but we, we haven't licked it yet, let me say that. But if that can be made to work, then all these big numbers that we saw today, like EA3, 1.2 million, those can be applied this method could be applied to those data sets. Questions coming back? Oh, the, the microphone's coming. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, I'll ask you again. Uh, what, what sample sizes do you think you'll need to go after rare variants and non additive effects? Well, can I still go back to the slides or not? No, I guess not. Um, so, uh, it depends on the genetic architecture of those non-additive effects. So, so if, when I expanded Y as a function of G, there was this G by G interaction term, which had a coefficient Z in front of it. If those interactions are not sparse, then we're dead, okay? Because the number of possible interactions is, say, 10 to the 6 squared, okay? And you're just in trouble. Um, but if there's some locality rule, like maybe the structure of that uh, G by G interaction is block diagonal or something like that, then it's possible. And we have actually written papers on how to apply compressed sensing specifically to that situation. So um, it will require more data, but it may not be untractable. However, it really depends on how nature is actually realized. One last question down here on the side. Hi, uh, we haven't talked about this, and it would probably take a whole other day of uh, conference to address it right, but given the fact that these tools are uh, accelerating so rapidly uh, and the implications of people potentially being typecast for success or not based on their uh, genetic makeup, what are some of your initial thoughts about how we, how we go into that uh, brave new world? <laughs> 
Well, I, I think it. I think all these things need to be discussed openly in society because society is going to have to make decisions about what it's going to allow and what it's going to not. What it's not going to allow. Um, to take a specific example, worldwide there are about a million cycles of IVF done now per year, and in some places about one percent of babies are born using IVF. Now, standard practice in IVF right now is to let the thing grow to 50 or 100 cells and then freeze it in liquid nitrogen, let the mother's body recover from the hormone shots that were done to harvest the eggs before the implantation. So there's actually plenty of time now to genotype the embryos. And it's actually quite common now to genotype the embryos. So if you want to talk about applying these predictors, they can be applied at the very before the beginning. right? Um, and so societies are going to have to decide, what, what are you allowed to do? What are you allowed to select for? What are you allowed to edit for? Editing is, of course, very speculative and far in the future. But, but selecting is not. Selecting is actually possible. It's being done right now. Mostly selecting against Down syndrome and selecting against Mendelian conditions. But once you have polygenic predictors, it costs almost nothing to measure the full SNP genotype of the embryo. You can make your decision based on what you get from that. So, I don't know where it's going to go. My prediction would be that different countries will uh, end up in different places. Rich people will travel to the permissive countries to have this kind of work done. Somebody mentioned that private school kindergarten, or private school, I forgot the, what it, public school tuition in the UK is like $45,000 a year, something like that. Well, the cost of a cycle of IVF is significantly less than that. And you get, you get effects that actually maybe are real and last for generations. Okay, thank you so much. Well, we, we have reached the end of the end of our day of talks and I want to thank everybody, uh, I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, I, I hope uh, you, you found um, the, these talks thought-provoking, um, intriguing and and full of potential as we go forward on this frontier research area. Um, one of the things also I'd like to say uh, is to thank to the communications team who has, run, who has run the event quite well today, and there have been smooth transitions throughout, so thanks to the communications team. And uh, we'd like to have some clothing, closing thoughts from um, Dr. Tom Skalik, our executive director. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, 